more time is usually spent planning missions than flying them. This is as it should be because proper planning is of the utmost importance in making the mission successful and increasing the effectiveness of the entire integrated operational intelligence system. The first part of this film will discuss some basic principles of mission planning that have been developed from actual combat experience with the IOIS. The second part will then trace the flow through the IOIC of intelligence data brought back by the reconnaissance missions. Basically, there are four different types of reconnaissance mission, each requiring different planning. First, there is general area reconnaissance, where we fly high and in depth to survey an entire objective area that may include several thousand square miles. Second, there is specific target reconnaissance that may be aimed at missile sites, airstrips, bridges, fuel dumps, and so on. Third, there is beach reconnaissance where we fly low to check on amphibious landing areas, coastal defense weapon systems, radars, and the like. And fourth, there is standoff or peripheral reconnaissance at some distance away from the center of interest where a passive ECM collects data on different kinds of electronic emitters. Some usable pan camera and side looking radar film may be obtained also. When the order for a reconnaissance mission is received, planning begins at once. Typically, the personnel on the mission planning board will be the IOIC supervisor, the photo interpretation officer, the carrier wing intelligence officer, the storage and retrieval officer, the electronic evaluation officer, a squadron air intelligence officer, a squadron operations officer, and an officer from the airborne system support center. Other specialists may be called in as needed. The first principle of good mission planning is to be sure the mission objective is thoroughly understood. Let's make sure we're all together on the mission objectives. <clears throat> we are asked to obtain photographic and electronic intelligence on this area. Now since this is quite a large area with many possible targets, it will be necessary to fly a high-altitude general reconnaissance mission from the coast to a point nearly 200 miles inland. And we are to collect data on electronic emitters, primarily ground control intercept, fire control, and missile-associated radar. We are also to fly a low-altitude beach reconnaissance to spot beach defenses, transportation facilities, bridges, railroad yards, port facilities, airfields and anti-aircraft artillery and missile sites in the area. Now, everybody clear on that? Obviously, the mission is more apt to be successful if its purpose is clearly understood by everybody. The second principle is to order all pertinent data from storage and retrieval. This will probably include all enemy orders of battle. It will include up-to-date charts of the area. It may include hard copy prints of the countryside, including checkpoint photography and targets previously photographed in the objective area. In some cases, a brief on the political situation in the country would be useful. Evasion and escape data, as well as search and rescue information, will be asked for. Everything in storage and retrieval that would be of value in planning the mission should be requested. The purpose of SNR is to store a vast amount of information that can be retrieved quickly. Its service should be used to the fullest extent. The third principle of mission planning is to determine the sensors that would best serve the purpose. For the high altitude flight and depth, the 18-inch pan camera would certainly be desirable. The fixed vertical camera would be effective also. 
side-looking radar employing a 40-mile wide strip would be desirable. Passive electronic countermeasures equipment would be utilized to collect data on electronic emitters. For the low-level beach reconnaissance, the forward oblique camera would be useful. So would the fixed vertical camera, the three-inch pan camera, and or side oblique cameras would be specified. Side-looking radar would also be useful. These are the ideal sensors for the two flights. Whether they are all available is a matter to be learned from the support center. The fourth basic principle of mission planning is to check the distances to be flown against the range of the aircraft. If the distance to the objective area plus the miles flown inland or along the beach plus the distance back to the carrier is beyond the fuel range of the RA-5Cs, it will be necessary to plan for in-flight refueling or perhaps to request that the missions be postponed until the task force is closer to the land area. This is a problem for the squadron operations officer. The fifth principle of mission planning is to check all known factors affecting the mission. Suppose a weather report indicates cloud cover may obscure targets from the camera lens. Then, side-looking radar is all the more essential since it penetrates normal cloud cover. If for some reason the three-inch pan camera is not available for the beach reconnaissance flight, then side oblique cameras will have to suffice. If the enemy has fighter aircraft, it may be necessary for the reconnaissance aircraft to be accompanied by a fighter escort. A known or suspected SAM site may require the use of defensive ECM or a change in the desired flight path. All such factors should be checked. Another factor that will affect the route planning is selecting penetration and retirement points. If entry and exit are made over prominent landmarks whose coordinates are known, the information may be useful later in correcting navigational data. Only after consideration of all factors affecting the mission can a final determination be made on sensors, route, and profile. The result is often a compromise. At this point, the pilots and navigators who are going to fly the mission will begin their own more detailed planning. They will have to accept the sensors and the general route and profile decided upon by the planning board, but the details of executing the mission will be their responsibility. The ninth principle is launch and recovery coordination with the operations and air departments. This is to assure that the mission will be launched at the proper time and that there is expeditious spotting of aircraft after recovery. The final step in mission planning is to alert the entire IOIC on matters that will concern them. They will need to know the estimated time of arrival of the aircraft so that processing facilities will be ready to take the film and tape immediately. They should know the priorities assigned to the various kinds of intelligence to be brought back so that hot reports can be made. They should know if hard copy prints of certain targets are wanted. They should know the exact route of the aircraft so they can prepare navigation correction checkpoints. These are the basic principles of mission planning. A checklist is a good reminder. To review quickly, the first principle is to be sure the mission objective is thoroughly understood. Then, order all pertinent data from storage and retrieval. Determine what the ideal sensors for the mission would be. Check the distances to be flown against the range of the aircraft. Check other factors such as orders of battle, the weather, the availability of sensors, and so on. Plan penetration and retirement over known points. 
make a final determination of sensors, route, and profile. Brief the pilots and navigators so they can do their detailed planning. Coordinate launch and recovery with the operations and air departments. Alert all sections of the IOIC on details that concern them. This part of the film has discussed the planning of reconnaissance missions to obtain photographic and electronic intelligence data. The second part will discuss the flow of this data through the IOIC upon return of the aircraft from the mission. Photographic intelligence data brought back by reconnaissance missions must flow smoothly through the IOIC. Many operations are involved, but considered step by step, a flow chart is easily understood. When the flights return to the carrier, the film cassettes are removed from the airplane and hand carried to the IOIC. This is the starting point of our data flow diagram. The exposed film is rushed into the film processing lab in the IOIC where the negative is developed. As the negative is being developed, a visual check may determine whether the code matrix blocks are satisfactory. A report should be made to the Airborne System Support Center. Flash reports to the flag will also be made to indicate successful coverage. While a stereometric comparison viewer can take a negative, normally a positive is made. The positives are then sent to the multi-sensor interpretation area where they are loaded into the SCV. As the photo interpreters study the film on the SCV, they may take several actions. They may request paper prints of certain shots from the film processing lab. They may order enlargements from the Filmac 300. They will get added information from the pilot and navigator. And they may compare notes with the electronic evaluator. As they continue to analyze the intelligence, they have a number of responsibilities. Most important, of course, is to make immediate reports on any new information that will be useful in planning strikes. The IOIC supervisor will see that pertinent information obtained by the mission is forwarded to the carrier division staff, the weapons coordinator, and the briefing room where missions are planned. As the immediate need for the information is satisfied, provision must be made for incorporating the intelligence into the permanent files of SNR. The PI provides film coverage plots, MITRAN data, intelligence reports, titling forms, and OOB reports. SNR then incorporates this information into the intelligence database. Selected information also goes to the Fleet Intelligence Centers and to the Naval Reconnaissance and Technical Support Center. As the intelligence is studied by higher command, including the original requesting authority, new or revised requirements may become apparent. If that is the case, a new reconnaissance mission may be ordered. Once again, the Mission Planning Board assembles to plan the new mission to supplement the intelligence that was obtained or to investigate further situations that may have been suggested by the first flight. When the new mission has been flown, the film is delivered to the IOIC and the data flow cycle begins again. Thus, the flow path is seen to be a cycle, repeated as new missions are flown and new intelligence is received.
The flow of electronic data through the IOIC is similar to that of photo intelligence. The rolls of magnetic tape are hand carried from the airplane to the IOIC. They are rewound and cut and loaded on the tape processor in the electronic data processing room. The data is reduced and converted from digital to alphabetic and numeric form using a three-step processing procedure. As printout material comes from the computer to the electronic evaluator, he analyzes it, submits hot reports on priority items, and initiates plotting of emitter locations on a chart of the area. In evaluating the electronic data that has been gathered by the ECM equipment, the electronic evaluator will correlate his information with the photo intelligence being analyzed by the photo interpreters at the SCV. The two sources of information supplement and complement each other. He will also correlate the ECM data with electronic data files maintained in the IOIC on magnetic tape. The electronic evaluator continues evaluating and reporting his findings. He feeds information to ELINT centers and to SNR so that orders of battle can be updated and forwarded to the Fleet Intelligence Center. From here on, the flowchart of electronic intelligence is the same as that for photo intelligence. In the same manner, higher command on studying the mission data may find a need for new or additional data. This may call for further reconnaissance flights. Upon their completion, the cycle begins again. These flowcharts are basic and should be thoroughly understood. However, operational requirements may call for some variations. As the efficiency of IOIC personnel improves, both photographic and electronic intelligence is processed and evaluated more quickly and flows more smoothly from the beginning to the end of the cycle. The capability of the integrated operational intelligence system is tremendous. An advanced reconnaissance airplane for gathering photographic and electronic intelligence and an up-to-date center for making tactical use of that intelligence. Proper mission planning and a smooth flow of intelligence data will develop that capability into an even more invaluable part of the overall carrier operation.